Thank you, Heather. Welcome to worship. This is the first Sunday of the month. And as such, if you're not familiar with the practices here at First Baptist, the first Sunday of the month is traditionally the opportunity that we take to remember, to observe what we call the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that yet again today. We're just going to do a little differently. We're not going to do this at the end of the service. We're going to do this before I give my message. And so as our servers go and get prepared, I want to read for you just a few verses that I've kind of grouped together out of the Gospel of Matthew. As Jesus stood before the governor... And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge. This was to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called the Messiah? Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Most important question any of us will ever ask and answer. What shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Then he released Barabbas to them. But... Jesus he had flogged and handed him over to be crucified. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all of the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Then the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And what a powerful statement. This is why we gather here this morning, because we recognize Jesus is in fact the Son of God. It's interesting that when Jesus came to this earth, he claimed to be the Son of God. At his death, those who doubted recognized that he was the Son of God. And then at his resurrection, he proved that he is, in fact, the Son of God. And, of course, we look forward to a future day when, once again, he will come as the Son of God, as the King of Kings, and he will establish his kingdom and we will be with him forevermore. But this morning we take a moment to reflect on and to remember that sacrifice that makes all of this possible. And we want to invite you to join us this morning in this thing that we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you have ever professed a faith in Jesus Christ, then we want to invite you to participate in this thing with us. With that, I want to encourage you that as we get prepared to take communion, that we spend a few moments in quiet reflection because you see the Apostle Paul had mentioned to the believers in Corinth the importance of coming together for such an occasion, but when you do so, it ought to be with a clean heart, with a clear conscience, with a right relationship with the Lord. Um, he warns that if we come to this table and our relationship with the Lord is not 
proper. It's not solid. We have unconfessed sin or unrepented sin in our lives, and we invite judgment upon ourselves. And so as we prepare to receive these elements this morning, I would encourage you that as we pass them, that you sit in a moment of quiet reflection, that you would sit in a moment to you search into your heart and to go before the Lord and ask Him to reveal anything that may be at odds with Him. And that before you participate with us, that you get that straight in your heart and in your mind with the Lord. They're going to come ahead at this time and we're going to partake of the bread. And Christ, as he gathered with his disciples in that upper room, had expressed that the bread, he holds it up, he breaks it after he gives thanks for it. And he demonstrates or he teaches that that bread is representative of his body. Of the fact that he would soon be going to the cross and that his body would be subject to the punishment that you and I deserve. So with that imagery on our minds, let's bow for just a moment in prayer before we pass these. Father in heaven, we again say thank you for this blessing and opportunity to be in this place this morning. We thank you for the fact that you sent your son to be the sacrifice for our sins. And through his coming, he claimed to be the son of God. Those who witnessed his life declared that he certainly was that, and his resurrection proves it. But Father, as we sang this morning, this is also reflective of the fact that you came to seek us. So we thank you for the sacrifice that makes a relationship with you possible. Father, stir our hearts and minds for these next few moments as we pass these elements and as we sit and reflect on our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Jesus was gathering with his disciples, he gave them a command, a fairly simple command, and that command was not, thou shalt observe communion once a quarter or once a month or even every day. The command was, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together this morning as we remember. Father, we again humbly bow in your presence. Grateful hearts for all that you have done. And now as we get ready to partake of this cup, we thank you for all that it represents. And Jesus had explained that this is uh, the symbol of a new covenant. No longer do you require the sacrifice of animals. The sacrifice of your son was sufficient and complete. And your word tells us that had it not been for the shedding of the blood of Christ, there could be no forgiveness for our sins. And Father, it's an amazing concept. Not simply for my sins, but the sins of the entire world. Each one of us here but certainly ought to be grateful for what you have done. Help us to never take lightly the commitment, the sacrifice. We ask in Jesus' name. Father, I, I don't have the words that express the proper gratitude for all that you have done. But it's with a grateful heart that I attempt to surrender in the best I know how to do as you're Word states that as often as we come together and, and we partake in this, that we, we are proclaiming the Lord's death. Father, I pray that I would not ever do that simply in ritual practice, but I would do it every day in reality. Father, we would all be the salt and light, that we would be the witnesses, the proclaimers of the good news that you have called us to be. 
It's the least we can do in light of the tremendous sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Give us the strength. Give us the courage. Give us the desire. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book or the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, we're going to continue on today in our series on the parables of Jesus. And you'll see that I titled the message this morning, The Rich Fool. I say I titled it that. That's not really my title. That is, that is the title that you've probably seen the heading in your Bible. As I was preparing for this message, a lot of different titles entered my mind. And one of those titles was The Accumulation Generation. Because we live in a time when we're all about gathering and collecting stuff and as much stuff as we can. And, and as I focused on that, the other thought that entered my mind was the possession obsession. We're possessed with having possessions or we're obsessed with having possessions. And, and we live in a time where we're told, you know, you, you need to have, you've got to have whatever it is that you want. And another one that I came across was gripped by greed. Right? I mean, all these things are true, but at the end of the day, I was looking at the title, and although it's not inspired, it's the best title for the message, uh, The Rich Fool. Because as we talk this morning about this parable, we're going to find out that um, the fool, even though it seems like a harsh admonition, and, and it is in many respects, we want to see what that foolish mindset truly is. You see, the reality is we live at a time or in a world where we're told that you can have it all. And in fact, we're told you should have it all. Whatever you want, right? I mean, we, we, we live in the, in the largest or the, the most significant, most bountiful period in history. We have more than we've ever had. And yet the desire for more is bigger and larger than it's ever been. And this idea, this, and this mentality, this idea of entitlement runs rampant through our society and you're entitled to everything and anything you want to whenever you want it and and you're entitled to it you deserve it to you you need to have it and our kids grow up leaving the home thinking they got to start off where mom and dad are leaving them right they don't understand we start and we work our way up and and our society and everything in our society is driven to make us feel that way there's not a single advertisement out there that's not designed with a tremendous amount of, of science and psychology behind the, the marketing that gets, gets this product, whatever it is, front and center, and makes you think you can't live another day without it. Whatever it is, and it could be the latest gadget. This thing I hear about nowadays, these fidget spinners. You hear about these things? You've got to have one. My kids are asking me, where can I buy a fidget spinner? I have no idea. I don't care. And this happens in my household all the time, right? My children and my wife, and I, I'm guilty of this sometimes too, right? We say, oh, but I need it. And I have this thing I do to my kids, and they really don't care for it, but they'll call me and say, Dad, I need to have whatever the need is. I say, oh, yeah? Define need. What does it mean you need this? Will you cease to exist at the end of this day if you don't have what it is you're asking for? But this is what's driven into our minds and our society. We've got to have it. We need it. And we deserve it. There seems to be, to me, and I don't know, I, I've recognized this in my generation, and some of you older probably recognize it even more than I have, but there's been this shift in thinking it seems once upon a time, I remember conversations with my grandfather when, when you entered into the workforce, the goal was to find a job that would provide security, to find a job you could settle into and a job that would provide you with a retirement, a pension, a job that would give you good benefits and, and you'd stay there and you would earn your living and you retire and, and you'd be comfortable. And nowadays it's like nobody could care about... The pension, nobody cares about the benefits. We, we live in a society where if you work at McDonald's, you've got to make $15 an hour. And regardless of the job, you need to make as much as you can possibly make so you can go out and spend it the way you want to spend it right now. There's been this shift, there's focus, and, and this mindset has permeated the church. And I don't mean necessarily this church, I mean the church universal. 
I mean, this, this era of health, wealth, and prosperity preachers is, is more popular than it's ever been, and people are uh, proclaiming presenters of the gospel, pastors, preachers. They're getting richer than ever because they're playing off of your desire for more and getting you to think that you deserve more and that God wants you to have more. And, and as a child of God, the mentality must be, oh God, aren't you lucky to have me? Now your responsibility is to bless me with whatever I want. A couple years back, I bought a book called Christianity in Crisis. A lot of good insights in that book. Some of it I don't care so much for. But as I was coming here, or as I was reading through that book, I came across this quote, which I think summarizes the mentality in a lot of the health, wealth, and prosperity circles that we see in our country. And this quote came from a gentleman by the name of Frederick Price, a very prominent health, wealth, and prosperity preacher out in California. He founded the Crenshaw Christian Center, so-called the home of the Faith Dome. And this man has titled himself an apostle, which ought to be the first red flag for anybody who gives heed to anything that he spews forth. But this mentality is just, I came across this quote in this book, and he once said this, and here's a quote. If the mafia can ride around in Lincoln Continental town cars, why can't the king's kids? And, and there's, there's the mentality. I mean, there's the thoughts, the musings of a rich fool. I'm sorry to say. But those aren't my words. That's what we find in the Bible. And when he was challenged on that position, this is his response. He said, you can talk about me all you want while I'm driving by in my Rolls Royce that's paid for and I've got the pink slip on it. Talk all you want. Bad mouth all you want. Don't hurt me in the least. Doesn't bother me. It's a whole lot easier to be persecuted when I'm riding in my car and I got the pink slip than when I'm riding in a car and owe my soul to the company store. Now, I don't often or lightly throw around the H word, heresy, but this is nothing but heresy. To, to try to proclaim this message that says you are God's child and you deserve to be blessed in every way that every other sinner is blessed and you deserve what everybody else gets is foolish. And it goes so against Scripture. How do we reconcile that with a James chapter 1 where it says count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations? The Christian life is not about what we can get out of it. So I left the title simply the way the Bible has it, The Rich Fool. Because it's so easy to fall into this trap and this mindset, especially in our society that seduces with the promise of effluence and measures your worth or your value based on your position or your possessions. And I want to make a disclaimer at this point. As I work through this passage with you this morning, I want you to understand these admonitions, this teaching, this warnings, these words of foolishness, it does not apply directly to the possession of things itself. And so I'm not coming down on anybody that makes money. I'm not coming down on anybody that makes good money. I'm not coming down on the possessions. That's, that's not the point of what this parable is teaching. The point behind all this is what is your attitude? What is your thoughts in regards to what God has blessed you with? And I've seen a lot of great Christian folk make all kinds of money who do nothing but honor God with it. And that's okay. But I've seen several others who fall into this trap. Even believers, if we're not careful... We kind of cross the line into enemy territory in regards to the things that we have and possess. And so with that, we jump into Luke chapter 12. And here's a parable that hopefully forces you to take a close look at your life and to ask some pressing and some revealing questions about not only who you are, but what God has blessed you with. 
Now, just to give you a little idea of the background and leading up to this parable, Jesus is once again amongst the crowds. He's been in his earthly ministry for quite some time. And if you look at chapter 12, verse 1, you see that it, already by this point, Jesus is drawing great numbers of people to hear his teaching. Verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, and that word many thousands literally means tens of thousands. And in fact, there are so many that they were trampling one another. And in the midst of this crowd, this swell of people who come around Christ, he, he capitalizes once again on an opportunity to squash any misconceptions about who he is or about the kingdom, about their beliefs. And in this passage, we see two primary warnings. The very first one, I can't go into detail, but it is encompassed in those first 12 verses. And the warning that we see there is in regards to hypocrisy, specifically against the Pharisees, which were proclaiming a false religion. And so he says, you all beware, be on the guard, be on the lookout for those who come and they don't know what they're talking about. Be on guard, be aware of the hypocrites, those who come with a false teaching or a false gospel. And he leads right from that into this teaching that we're going to talk about today in regards to money or more specifically materialism. So he's addressing the two biggest areas that cause problems in a believer's life. One is false teaching. It deals with the spiritual element of the Christian life. Beware of false doctrines, false gospels, those things that will lead you down the wrong path in this life. Watch out for those things. That's the spiritual element. And then he's saying, watch out for the material things. Because you are going to be blessed. And you're going to have... And if you're not careful, you will fall into the trap of this young gentleman that we see in the passage before us this morning. Two strong warnings. We come in, focus on the second as we begin verse 13. It says, someone in the crowd, in the mass of the tens of thousands, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And so here what we have apparently is a younger sibling, brother of an eldest brother. And, and, and what would be implied by this situation is dad has passed on. And, and in this time, in this culture, the responsibility at that point would fall on the eldest son. And the eldest son would, would be entitled to a, a greater portion of the estate. And then everybody else would fall in line accordingly. Most often, rather than trying to liquefy and get all the money and all the assets so we could distribute it amongst the siblings and family members, what would happen more often is the eldest son would take on the role of the father and he would take on the land and he would take on the responsibility of maintaining the land, the property, all the benefits, all the assets of what dad had left behind so that he can continue to take care of his family. And in the midst of this crowd, here comes this young man that says, teacher, Tell my brother. And here's Jesus in the midst of teaching some very important principles. And it's almost like this young man, he couldn't care less about what it is that Jesus has got to say. He doesn't care about heaven. He doesn't care about the religion. He came there with this mentality that says, what can I get out of this man? And so he's very indifferent to the teaching of Christ. We find that he is simply concerned with his own selfish desires. And see, this was not all uncommon to bring this sort of thing to a rabbi. In fact, the Jews tried to keep things out of court the best they possibly could. And so when they had a disagreement, when they had a dispute, they would go to the rabbi and they would sit at the rabbi's feet and they would say, here is our problem. Please instruct us on what we need to do. And so here's this young man who goes before Jesus disregards everything that Jesus is trying to tell him and says, teacher, tell my brother to be concerned with me. And this is the mentality that we see throughout this entire story. Verse 14, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? 
And so immediately Jesus rejects this role. He's saying, this is not why I came. I did not come to settle the disputes in regards to material blessings amongst you people. In fact, one commentator said he came to bring men to God, not money to man. And I kind of like that. This is not why I came, but this is clearly the, the, the heart and the concern of this young man. And Jesus responds in such a way that says, I'm not here to take care of those problems. But if you are going to turn to me as your judge, then you better be prepared for what I'm, for what I'm about to tell you. Because you clearly need some direction. You clearly need some counsel. And this is exactly what Jesus is going to do. Because I think in this moment he realizes no answer that he's going to give this young man is going to uh, satisfy the problem at hand. Somebody has once said that covetousness is an unquenchable thirst. And I believe that to be mostly true. Somebody once asked Rockefeller, how much money is enough money? And he quickly replied with just one dollar more just a little bit more right just just one more and we all we all understand what that feeling is so jesus takes this opportunity once again to address the real concern verse 15 then he said to them watch out now he at this point has turned his attention from the one young man who has had the issue and he turns to address the whole crowd. In fact, the verse before where it says you, it's in the plural form. And as it says here, watch out, be on your guard. He's once again saying to them, addressing the crowd, addressing the masses. And with that, we've got to understand that he's addressing everybody because everybody needs to hear this. Now understand, in that crowd, there were believers. And in that crowd, there were unbelievers. And anything else that's in between that you can think of. But he takes this opportunity to address them all. Recognizing this is not just a, a teaching for the lost. This is a teaching for those who believe as well. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. What's it say? Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And that's where most of us say, okay, well now time out. This is not talking about me because I do not have an abundance of possessions. Right? I mean, this, is, this is our mentality. We all think, well, somebody... Else. And here's the problem because, because we're human. We're always judging what we don't have against what somebody else does have. This is what we do. And so somebody's got the bigger boat or they got the nicer house or the newer car or the bigger truck or the, the better power tools or the prettier hair or the prettier nails or the better shoes. Shinier head, right? Turtle wax is how you do that, by the way. There, there's, there's always something. And, and so we don't tend to look at our lives as somebody who has an abundance of possessions. And so we say, extra, not me. Listen to me. You have extra. Has anybody in this room ever used a garbage disposal? What is that? That is getting rid of extra. Right? Right? And that's just on a, on a little level. How many of you ever traded something in, something that worked for a better something? Right? You had a car, and it was a good car, and that was fine, but it wasn't a new car. Right? It wasn't a bigger truck. I was young and dumb once. I did these same things. I had a nice truck, but I got my eyes on a bigger, better black truck that was a 4x4. Four four. My little truck wasn't a 4x4. Four I need a better truck. It worked great. And I don't know how many times since then I've regretted getting rid of it and trading it in. But you see, we, we all do this. We all have an abundance of things. How many of you ever traded a phone that works for a new cell phone that's newer and, and more up to date and the latest, greatest technology or your computer, or your iPod, all this, whatever it is. See, we've all done this on some level. We all have access. How many of you all have a garage that you can't put the car in? Right? Because we got too much stuff. I listen, listen, I'll admit, I've got too many possessions as well. If you go to my house, my cars aren't in my garage. One, they don't fit. But two, I got all my mom's garbage in there as well. I just sold her house and I got all kinds of stuff. And but, but this is this is reality. We all have, you know, that closet, that basement. I tell you, when I moved out to New Mexico, it's probably the first time this ever really hit me. 
Because when I moved from Springfield, Missouri to Hobbs, New Mexico, I left with every possession that I owned. And you ever load a moving truck, that in and of itself will reveal the fact you've got too much stuff. But as I moved to New Mexico, I did not have a house I was moving into. We were going to live in our camper for a while until we found a house. So I had to take all my possessions and put them in a storage unit. And as I got to town, and you look up storage units, there's a dozen or better storage units in this town. You want to know what the problem was? The problem was not finding a storage unit. It was finding a storage unit that had an available space. Because they were all full. Have you ever driven by those things on the interstate or through town and wonder what on earth are in those storage units that's so important that you, you couldn't live without at one point and now they're in storage where you can't use them or most of the time can't even get to them or you forget that you had it? Or you ever wonder how many people still are storing the things in there that aren't even paid for yet? They're still paying the credit card bills that put them all there to begin with? Why? Because somewhere along the lines, you're convinced you couldn't live without it. We need it. We got to have it. Our lives will be so much happier and so much easier if we have it. Listen to me this morning. You have an abundance of possessions. If you've got a house for shelter and you can pay your utilities and you've got a car. Listen, if you made it into this room this morning, you're doing better than a lot of others. We all have an abundance of possession. None of us exempt. Now, keep in mind that as we work through this, Jesus is not forbidding the, the, the things. What he is forbidding is the desire for more. And, and what does that mean? How much is enough? What is more? Well, how much more? Is, and I guess the best way I can summarize this is, is when your desire becomes more or the desire to have more than what the kingdom has already provided for you. When, when you get from that place of being content to disconnect, discontent because you don't have what somebody else has got. That, that, that's kind of what this passage is alluding to. And so Jesus, recognizing that all of us, including those in his crowd and those sitting in this room this morning, have a tendency to fall into this trap. He takes this opportunity to tell this parable to help reveal the dangers of a covetous heart. So we go to verse 16. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And right here, this is, and I can only imagine the young gentleman who asked the question is probably starting to get pretty excited about where Jesus is starting to go with this story. He wants stuff, and Jesus launches into a story where there's this rich landowner who has a bumper crop and has got more than he knows what to do with. He had extra. But one thing I want you to recognize as we work through this is he had extra of things that he had no control over. What we see is a very selfish perspective from somebody who had no control over what kind of crop he would receive this particular year. He, he has no way of controlling the, the fertileness of the soil. He has no way of controlling the sunlight. He has no way of controlling the germination process. He has no way of controlling the rain or the lack thereof that would affect the crop that he would harvest. He, he is just completely blinded by this abundant harvest that he has. And he goes on in verse 18. Then he said, this is what I'll do. You notice the words I'm highlighting in these passages? He says, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Here we've got this gentleman patting himself on the back. Good job. You, you did so good. You, you, you bless yourself so amazingly. You have so much. And we see just this incredible selfishness. And as the story is being told, he doesn't even consult with a wife or kids. We don't know if there is a wife or kids. He's just thinking to himself. That's what the passage says. Self, you're pretty awesome. You've done so good for yourself. 
You have plenty. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now listen. These ideas aren't bad ideas. Right? The Bible advocates for for thinking and planning ahead. There's something to be said for making sure you're prepared for retirement. There's something to be said for for leaving an inheritance to your children. There's something to be said for being able to pay your bills and and plan accordingly, right? We don't just live day by day like a bunch of fools who expect Christ to return that night and so we don't take on any other responsibility. So he's thinking ahead and that's good. The problem is he's not thinking far enough ahead. He's too short-sighted. He's too blinded by the here and now. You see, this person, by all outward appearances, would have been considered or would have indicated the fact that he was a a good person or he was a successful person. Jesus draws the the teaching to a point where uh, that's outward appearances. The problem is he spent too much time and too much focus on the here and now, and he didn't think about what comes after. He didn't think about the eternity that lies in the balance He lived for himself, and he lived only for right now. But up to this point, I imagine that this young man was getting pretty excited about what Jesus was fixing to say until we get to verse 20. But God said, and I imagine this must have kind of hit this young man kind of like a freight train. Getting all excited about this rich man, and surely he's going to tell him, distribute your wealth, that's great. That's not what Jesus says, verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. You fool. Now, the word fool right there means literally to be mindless or to be lacking sense, to be destitute of knowledge or truth. And anytime he uses that word fool, he's not talking about a mental capacity in a physical way. He is talking about a spiritual concept. He's talking about a spiritual application. And in other words, if all you do is get wrapped up in the here and now, you're a fool because this here and now is but a short little time. It's but a vapor, a blink of an eye. And then we're all going to be launched into eternity. And the question is, what are you doing right now in regards to the future eternity that is coming? So he says, you're a fool. Not for being rich. He's a fool because of his confusion over what the extra was all about. He didn't know why he had it. And so let me point out to you just two things, two reasons as to why Jesus refers to this man as a fool. And the very first reason is is because he's only thinking in terms of the tangible. Right? He's, he's thinking about the immediate. He's thinking about the here and now. He's thinking about the things that he can grasp and consume for himself. He is, he is completely self-indulgent into what life has to offer in this moment. And that's one reason why he's foolish. The second reason uh, he's referred to as a fool is because he couldn't care less about anybody else. He couldn't care less about God. He couldn't care less about others. In this story, he never once prayed to say, God, thank you for what you have provided me with. And in light of all that I have, what would you like me to do with it? He never sought that divine guidance or counsel. He certainly lacked wisdom, but he never caught up with James who said that when you don't have it, ask God and he'll at least reveal it. He never expressed gratitude for God. He took credit. I mean, as we mentioned once already, he had no control over the rain. He had no control over anything in reality that gave him this blessing. And so here comes Jesus to point out the fact that he's not really a a rich man. He's a rich fool. He's, He's bankrupt. He's bankrupt spiritually. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what this is really all about. He's a fool because he sought to please himself and never thought of how he could use this abundance to bless others. He's under the assumption that this was all for him. 
to be used any way he sees fit. And Jesus says, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You fool. See, none of us, none of us know how long we're going to be here on this earth. This man is going about making plans for all of his future. A smart man, clearly. I mean, there's even a point where he said, you know what, I'm not going to build more barns. I'll use up valuable land that I, that I can use for providing more for myself. I'm going to tear down the barns that I have, and I'm going to build newer, bigger barns. And I'm going to store it all up, but I'm going to keep it, and I'll be the master of myself, and I'm going to be all set for years to come. I can, I can distribute just enough every year to keep the prices high and to live high on the hog, so to speak. Of course, he's a Jew. He wouldn't have been on the hog, but um, the beef, maybe. I don't know. And Jesus says, you're going to die tonight. And then what's going to happen to everything that you earn for yourself? You work so hard for it. Because, listen, you can't take it with you. And who knows who's going to get it? It could be somebody who's going to honor it and respect it, and that would be great. It could be somebody who foolishly squanders it. It could be somebody who knows nothing about your work ethic and your values and your principles. Good grief, good chance I might end up with the government. But Jesus says, you don't know. You don't know. The problem is he sought security in everything but from the Lord. He, he was blinded by what the world had to offer. And so, Jesus, verse 21, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. And here's the application. The application is not simply for the young man who cried out in the midst of the crowd, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. He said, this is the way, not just for that man, this is the way for whoever is lost and trapped in that same mindset. Those who store up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. What is it, how is it going to be? He's saying it's going to be like total loss. You, you, will, you will spend your entire time here and accumulating on this earth and you're going to lose it all because you never sent anything on ahead. You, you never invested in what the eternity is really going to be. Why? Because you had the wrong perspective. And this introduces another question. Verse 21 it says, this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. That will be something I'm going to encourage you to investigate. What on earth does that mean? To be rich toward God. What, does that mean we sell everything and live in a great big old commune and just look after one another's affairs and, and support one another? No, that's not what it means. You know, there's a lot of different things and, and just one clue, and I can't dive into it, but if you fast forward a little bit through that passage in verse 33, this is one little clue that you get. It says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then verse 34, well known, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sell your possessions. All of them? No, not all of them. Maybe the excess ones. Maybe some of the abundance of possessions that you have. You ever had a garage sale? Right? What is a garage sale? Selling all the extra. And maybe one way, just one way that you can be rich towards God is maybe you're going to say, you know what? It wouldn't be a bad deal to get my car in the garage, and so maybe I need to have a garage sale, and maybe I'll take all the profits from that garage sale, and maybe I'll take that out in the community and honor the widows and the orphans and those who are less fortunate than myself. That's one way to be rich toward God. And I don't want you to take this the wrong way. This is not the preacher getting up and saying, boy, it's time to start padding the offering plate with more money. That's not what this is about either. The idea is perspective. 
The idea is perspective. perspective. In fact, I, I want you to see that the whole point of this parable, if you're keeping along in your notes, is, is we must keep our possessions in proper perspective. Listen, everything that you have, I know you've worked hard. But listen, you haven't got it in and of yourself. God gave you the ability to work. It's like this rich fool with the bumper crop. He has no control over the circumstances in life that gave him that crop other than he went to work. But listen, the provision comes from God. And that truth remains today. Oh, but I work hard. That's great. Who gave you your physical health so you could go do it? That comes from God. And so in the abundance of everything that he's given us, the, the reasonable thing to do is to keep in proper perspective the why. Why has he blessed me? And I know it's so hard to do that because as I stated at the very beginning of this thing, we often look towards those who have what we don't have. And so we don't look at ourselves as being particularly blessed. We look at others as being blessed. You know, this parable helps us understand that there's no bigger fool than the one who does not prepare for the life to come. This, this idea of being rich toward God, this idea of, of sending your riches ahead. Listen, there's going to be time coming when your number is called. And you're going to be launched into eternity. Hopefully it's an eternity in heaven. And the question for you who are going to heaven is what on earth have you sent ahead that you get to enjoy when you get there? And again, hopefully you don't think I'm talking about material things. We're talking about those spiritual blessings, those rewards, the opportunity we'll have to offer those back to the feet of Christ. Why? Because we'll, we'll have to recognize all of his goodness. I mean, we, shoot, we celebrated the, the communion here just this morning. There, there's just one thing that he has done and a list a mile long or all the things that he has done for you. What's the least that you can do for him? You see, the critical issue is not the amount of our treasure. That's, that's not what this is about. It's the location. And if you've been blessed and you have more than most, that's great. I'm not coming down on anybody who's all set and ready for retirement. The question, the challenge is, as I said at the very beginning, just to face those searching questions that deal with why God has blessed you so extraordinarily. You see, what you do with what you have is a great barometer of your spiritual maturity of how much God has blessed you. And we need to keep those perspectives. I was reminded of that saying that we all know from Jim Elliott was that he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. That, that, that's a lot of what's going on in this parable. He couldn't keep all the things that he made important. And rather than exchanging those things for treasures that he couldn't possibly lose, he had the completely wrong perspective as to why he was so abundantly blessed. Two things I want you to do by way of application this morning. Two things. The first thing that I want you to do, and, and whether you do it where you sit or you get to go home from this place and sit down and enjoy lunch with the family, wherever you are, the very first thing I want you to do is say thank you to God. Listen, if you are in this place this morning, you have been blessed. You have an abundance, whatever it may be. Even if you're a child, I'd be willing to bet you your closet's full of toys you haven't touched in a year or more. Same for the adults. Thank God. And the second thing I want you to do is follow up that gratitude with a simple question of why do I have extra? Thank God for what he's given you. And if you haven't done this in a while, I want you to go home and I want you to get on your knees. I want you to talk to your family. And I just want you to get together and, and, and collect and say, God, why? What do you want me to do with this stuff? And I'm not saying all your stuff. See, I hear the principle, I think, is simply God blesses you, right? And, and he gives to you. The problem comes when he gives to us and we clench our fists around what he's given us and say, I'll never let it go again. Because now it's a mine. That's what this man did in this parable. God blesses you, but he wants you to keep your hands open. Why? Because he might take it away and give it to somebody else. Or, and this is more often the case, he desires to put something else in it. He can't do that when we're like this. 
Let me leave you with 2 Corinthians 9.11. Just as something to chew on for a little while. It says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. There's one principle in regards to material possessions that you need to learn. And you need to ask and seek direction from God. Stand with me if you will. The team's going to come ahead and they're going to close us in a song which is most appropriate. The song is, I Surrender All. And again, as you get ready to leave this place this morning, I am not saying go get rid of everything you have. That's not the point. God may want you to keep the things he has blessed you with so that you can use it to be generous to others. The question in your heart's got to be, am I willing to surrender it if you want to? Sing with us.